Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to Car Question. And I'm happy today because we're going to talk about all-wheel drive system, but also because we've got an expert with us, Dave Coleman of Mazda. How are you doing, man? I'm doing great. How, how was your skiing today? Ah, it was perfect. <laughs> uh, look at the hair. They're so different. <laughs> but we're here to talk about all-wheel drive system. And first of all, I want to to thank you guys from Mazda because you're the first manufacturer to tell us, hey, we're going to come and talk with you about your all-wheel drive test that you are doing. You probably saw that, huh? Oh, we saw it plenty, yeah. <laughs> okay. And today we tested the new CX-5. You talked to us about that famous all-wheel drive system and how it interacts with the G-Vectoring control, with the traction control, and also with the stability system. So first, talk to me about your system and how it works. All right, so the basic idea is it's an on-road oriented system. We're trying to do two things at once. One, we want to maximize the fuel efficiency because a lot of times if you're driving around with an all-wheel drive car, 99% of the time you don't need it. And so you're paying a fuel economy penalty for that. So we want it to be as low impact as possible on your fuel efficiency. And then second, we want to make sure that it is giving you the maximum traction possible when you need it before you know you need it. So if you're on something slippery, we want the system to detect you're on something slippery before you do. Recognize that the tires are going to slip, send torque to the back before they slip, and then you just feel control and confidence the whole time. And this is not a myth, guys. You were right about that. Mazda is using a lot of sensor and even the wipers to tell the system, hey, there might be a slippery situation here. Yeah, exactly. It's very difficult to measure what's actually on the ground outside the car, but we figured out that there is so much data flying around inside the car already from other systems that if we interpret that data properly, we can recognize when a slippery surface is being driven over and we can anticipate what to do with it. So we can sort of predict the likelihood of it by looking at the outside temperature gauge that we already have, looking at if the windshield wipers are on, that's, that's a good hint, right? And looking at like the incline that the car is on, because the more steep uphill you are, the less weights on the front tires, the more likely they are to slip. You have a combination of all, if it's below freezing and the wipers are on uh, and you're going up a hill, you're probably gonna need some rear torque, right? And then other parts of the car can measure the surface directly. So for example, the electric power steering, you notice if you're driving on snow, the steering is lighter than if you're driving on yeah. dry pavement, right? The torque sensor in the electric power steering is actually inadvertently directly measuring the surface grip. So we have the steering system talk to the all-wheel drive system and tell it what's going on. Even if you're not applying torque, you're going downhill, for example, starting to go around a corner. If you hit a slippery spot, as soon as those front tires hit, the all-wheel drive system is going to know about it. And it's going to be able to transfer torque to the rear. Even under engine braking, connecting the front and rear wheel stabilizes the car. So as soon as the front tires hit that slippery spot, the rear tires can be ready and can be primed by the time they hit that same spot. Today, it's more all about electronics. It's playing a major role because back in the days, it was mainly mechanical system right. that was doing the job with all wheel drive. But today there is more and more electronic, but those system needs to communicate fast. Yeah, exactly. And the mechanical system, you know, has to be robust and well designed in the yeah. first place. But the kind of mechanical system that, that we're using now and that almost everybody is using a similar system, it's front wheel drive, it drives the rear drive shaft all the time. And then right between the drive shaft and the differential, there's a clutch that can disengage or engage or any amount in between. Now, when those clutches were mechanically controlled, like a viscous coupling or something, for example, uh, those all-wheel drive systems were really bad because the tires would have to slip a lot before the rear would engage. And so th that kind of system was a big compromise. It was just kind of for getting you out of a ditch. It wasn't for making the car handle well. Apply the electronics the right way, you can take that very basic layout and you can kind of get the best of both worlds. You can get the fuel efficiency that that system guaranteed and still have the performance of a center differential kind of system. You saw the video that we did uh, about the Mazda lineup. We yeah. tested the CX-3, the CX-5 the CX-9, which yeah. had a similar system, right. but we did get different results on our famous hill where we tested the diagonal test. Uh, before getting in more detail, I want you to give me your point of view about what happened in that first video, because we had some others, right. but right there, that first video, what happened exactly from an engineering point of view? Yeah, so it's interesting. It took us a while to sort of deconstruct what was going on there as well. So you um, check our video. Oh, we definitely watched that video. <laughs> and actually, your video was really helpful for me because I'm trying to communicate with uh, guys in Japan who are designing these systems and to help them understand what kind of situations we might need to make adjustments for. And because you test every single car on that same hill, it's a great reference point. So I can say, look, this is the kind of situation that's catching us out and we need to do better here. And the evidence is right there in front of them and irrefutable. So actually, your video was very, very helpful for us to make the system better. Actually, we had a comment, and this is a rumor, so 
you're free to tell me if it's real or not. Yeah. You've got a test seal which is similar to ours right there at Mazda. So is that true? Uh, we have now. I don't think we've built anything particularly on that, but there, you go. <laughs> th there is there is a scenario when you're driving off road um, that occurs pretty often on, on a steep, slippery surface where a tire will will slip a little bit and it digs a little bit of a hole and builds a pile behind it. And the way um, if you lock the front and rear wheels together, but you still have open diffs at the front and rear, yeah. anytime you spin one tire, the opposite tire on the opposite corner of the car is going to, to spin as well. Uh, because as you take some load off of that tire, it kind of tilts, kind of like if you take, yeah. uh, if you have a, a table that's a little tippy, the opposite corners are, are kind of going off off the ground, right? So it takes load off the opposite corner, and then that one spins a little bit too, and they dig two holes. And it's just like uh, when you're skiing, moguls form on a ski hill, on a, on a steep, slippery surface, these kind of twist ruts form that will start picking up opposite corners of the car. Uh, oh. and, and so your, your test is kind of similar to, to one of those, but maybe a little bit more repeatable, right? But what exactly happened? Why did the CX-9 gave up so soon in that video? The reason the CX-9 did it and the other cars didn't, it has to do with actually the wheelbase relative to how uh, long your hill is. So it would pick up the front tire and have to continue lifting the rest of the car while that tire is off the ground. Most of the other cars, they'd get the tire up in the air, and just as it starts to spin two opposite corners, it tilts down onto yeah. that front tire and then it pulls itself out. And because uh, of the, the length of that car and the fact that it doesn't have a big heavy V6 in the nose, it's a little, the weight distribution is a little bit better, it holds the tire up in the air longer and now it has to lift the whole weight of the car on three tires. Um, and when you see that front tire spinning, what you can't see is the opposite rear tire yeah. is also spinning, that one's unloaded. So those, those two are spinning at the same time and then it, it can't put one of them down to pull up. So what finally happened to have the oil drive system disconnect is as it's trying to go up and sliding back down, trying to go up and sliding back down, every time that rear tire stops and it's still applying a bunch of torque, that clutch right in front of the rear yeah. diff will slip a little bit. So it's some kind of safe mode in that kind of way. Well, we have an algorithm in the system that want to make sure that the fluid in that clutch pack lasts for the lifetime of the car, okay. right? So we have to make sure that it doesn't overheat. And every time it slips, it puts a certain amount of heat energy into that system. So we're, we're monitoring how much it slips and how much torque was applied during that slip and for how long. So we'll know exactly how much heat went into it. And then we know how quickly that heat dissipates out uh, of the diff. And so there's a little algorithm that's saying, all right, this went in, this came out, this went in, this came out. And so if you keep doing it too fast, it goes in faster than it comes out. And it'll pass a threshold where we don't want it any hotter than this or else it's going to limit the life of that clutch. And so then we'll shut it off and you'll get that overload light. And then if you get that overload light, you just wait a couple minutes, turn the car off. Yeah, it, it will on. come back. Yeah, because yeah, it's watching and it's timing as the heat dissipates out into the diff and out into the air, it'll cool back down and it can do it again. So it's actually not damaging the system. What it's doing is protecting the system from being damaged. Now, the reason that we spun those opposite tires more than some other cars actually has nothing to do with the all-wheel drive system. It has to do with our traction control system and our strategy on that. Uh, and that ultimately kind of goes back to our philosophy of how we want the car to be controlled in more common on-road driving situations. So uh, our traction control systems will tend to let the tires spin more than uh, others do um, because it's our belief that when you spin a tire, if the car then suddenly grabs the brakes, cuts the power, but shuts you down yeah. like that. You're, you're losing you're, oh, control God, in some I've kind of lost, way. I've just lost control and now I have to start over again. That's really frustrating. What we do, when the tires start spinning, we start reducing the power, but we don't grab the brakes. And what happens is then the tires spin and slow down a little bit, and the car kind of catches up to the tires. And that whole time during that wheel spin, you're in control, right? Yeah. Uh, and so it's ultimately a much better driving car in 99% of the conditions and the, until the tire's up in the air. Yeah. And once the tire's up in the air, then we really need the brakes. Oh, it's counterintuitive, but this is now when we need to close the traction system. Yeah, so that's very confusing. So um, we had figured out that there was this condition where the yeah. where the twists would pull a tire up off the ground and where we needed the brakes to be stronger. And we figured that out before your video came along. And we had the algorithm in development. And in fact, it was in some of the other cars, but it wasn't in the CX-9 yet because we can't update the software in the middle of a, of a production run. We have to wait for a model year. So it was coming out model year by model year in each different car, and CX-9 was the last one that was going to get it. So it was just bad luck for us that you got there before yeah. we did. But this um, answered in some kind of way the evolution that we saw. When we get to the final video that we did, yeah. we send it into the hill and it's going to pass the test. The reaction is completely different. There's no modification from a mechanical standpoint of view. It's only about algorithm. I exactly. On our SUVs, we have a traction control off 
setting. And the reason that's there is if you get in a situation where you're really stuck, where the traction control is reducing power so much that you can't get out of where you want to get out, you turn the traction control off and now you have complete control over everything. In that same situation, it turns out there's, we have two traction control systems going on at the same time. One of them is in the ABS module that controls the brakes, and that's applying brakes. One of them is in the, the PCM that controls the engine. So normally on a normal paved surface or on snow, when all the tires are on the ground, we're trying to let just control it with the engine, bring the power down a little yeah. bit, and let the car catch up and then accelerate away. We felt it with the CX-5 today, you know, with that kind of bad weather, because often uh, when we need all-wheel drive in snow, in sand, even on wet surface, it's not always the same surface that we encounter. Yeah. There is so much different type of snow, and the one in here that we, <laughs> that we encounter in Whistler, heavy, wet, humid, and nearly was comparable very to some sand. It's yeah. very slippery yeah. also. Yeah. But so what, what we do when we turn that traction yeah. control off, we're turning off the engine control. So now it gives you full power. But at the same time, because we recognize this other place where we could get stuck, we turn the brake control on harder. Okay. So it's counterintuitive because of the way the button's labeled. But in a stuck situation, one of the things that could happen is you don't have enough power because we've limited the power. The other thing that could happen is your tire could be up in the air. And so we need to apply the brake to the tire that's in the air because that will force torque to the other side where the tire's on the ground. So turning the traction control off actually flip-flops what those two traction control systems do. We're working on a better label for the button that's going to make more sense. <laughs> but in the meantime, try, try doing that. <laughs> Perfect. Dave, I've got some questions for you because a lot of our viewers ask us a lot of questions. And thank you, by the way, guys, because we made a last-minute post on that. So. Uh, feel free to answer whatever you think from an engineering point of view. I want, you to be I want you to be real honest. So what are your thoughts on those various YouTube roller tests and your special diagonal test is talking about our, our videos? Right. Well, the diagonal test is, is a real condition where the car has to lift its, up, its own weight up a hill in a situation where the, the tire doesn't have traction. So uh, I think that's a completely valid test. Um, the, the situation, you're not going to run into it in that particular situation. Nobody's driving up those ramps. Um, the advantage of doing it the way you do it is that it's more consistent than dirt. Every time it rains or you drive another car over a dirt course, it changes, right? Yeah. Um, I, I, I might suggest for your course that you should draw a line on the course and follow the same line each time. Because I've gone through and compared a bunch of different vehicles on yeah. yours. I'm like, oh, that one took an easier line than this one. And, uh, so You're right, you're right. <laughs> we are working on something more reliable, more predictable, more precise, guys. Don't worry about that. And yeah. we're going to take your advice, Mr. Dave. Thank you so much for that. So the next question is, how does a pass or fail an all-wheel drive system on these test results actually relate to the way uh, they understand a good all-wheel drive system should perform in real life, real daily condition? By the way, there is so much different condition out there. Our tests, I know, will probably happen to somebody like 0.009% of a time <laughs> for a CX-5 signature. You know, we're not supposed to take them off-road in some kind of way, but how does it rely? Yeah, so the, the condition you're testing is a pretty extreme condition for what the way most people drive these cars. And really the way people are buying SUVs now is to use them as cars that they will occasionally you know, go camping with or something like that, right? Uh, and in this particular case where it was a trade-off between the traction control, how should it work ideally in 99% of the time versus how should it work in this weird one weird case, we chose to make it work better most of the time. Um, it would be nice if it could just sense that you're on that kind of condition. Yeah. There's some software and supplier reasons why that's more difficult than it seems. Um, but I think if, if you're looking at a test like that and trying to understand if that makes the all-wheel drive system a good system or a bad system, if you're, tr if you're going to be doing exactly that with the, with the car, then it's a, it's a perfectly good measure. But realize that that doesn't necessarily translate to how the system works in the conditions you're normally driving in. Um, so there are there are trade-offs and complexities between these systems that aren't yeah. necessarily obvious. The reason that test is good on a video is because you can see what's happening. Um, the this, this stuff that we're doing to carefully manage the torque split, to get the car to behave exactly right, you can feel that when you drive the car, but it's really hard to film a feeling. 
You're, you're so right. <laughs> and I need your computer guys to see. I need to data log something to get more detail on that. So let's continue the question because there are some other good. Uh, what are these tests not revealing about the way they program their own all-wheel drive iActive? So another good question. Yeah, I think I think we've gone over yeah, that to some to some extent. Yeah. But that 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 the first of all that the the problem you saw was not actually a problem with the all-wheel drive, but with the traction control. Traction control. It doesn't matter. It's a it was problem's a problem, right? Um, but that there is a direct compromise there between the normal driving in that particular condition where we. Uh, prioritized yeah. the, the, nor the daily driving. So Mazda is more about driving dynamics, guys. You know, these machines are not really meant to go off-road. We test them because... Well, that said, I've gone pretty far off-road. Yeah. Uh, how five. far? How far? <laughs> 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 I've gone far enough that all the Jeep guys were very surprised when they saw uh, the CX-5 out where they thought only their Jeeps could go. <laughs> uh, I want a test vehicle to go that far. We won't do that, guys. But, but Dave... Thank you so much for taking time to answer all these questions. Guys, we will do another video about the Mazda 3 all-wheel drive, so get ready. We're going to prepare that soon. And thank you to Mazda to answer directly our question from us and our viewers. Absolutely. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. So guys, if you like, feel free to comment in the, in the comment section down there below. Do a thumbs up because you like that video. And if you have any more questions, feel free to write to us. Mazda will be there to answer them. Subscribe, the bell, to get all the notifications. Take care.